Well, what I'm going to present today is a bit of reflective of our research experience and attempt to grapple with this in inf informality. As you all know, it's been said that the urban development paradigm in Indian context or many developing countries is informality or development paradigm itself is informality of word that uh, used also is jugad as I it's been written because in absence of systems and formal systems in place or sometimes in reaction to the formal systems and regulatory systems in place uh, people business even even to extend government make do with jugad or informal approaches. Uh, government also finds sometimes its own regulatory mechanism a bit problematic and then creates alternative mechanisms of intervention. So that's the background within which we are grappling in the cities as to now what do we do with this existence of such a large informality because finally quality of life need to be improved in the cities and live aside whatever prime minister is talking about smart cities but if you leave that aside uh, the reality is to improve living conditions in the cities and how do we grapple with this idea of informality because while doing so we have an existence of informality we have come across certain uh, limits beyond which things need to be formalized and I'm going to speak about that today then speaking about what kinds of informality exist because I think together USC and UCLS put a voluminous amount of research work in this area so I don't need to go over the existence of informality but what are the issues that come across when we start intervening into the processes and attempting to change. Uh, what also we find is that the literature tells us different approaches of legalistic approach of structuralist approach or even welfare approach uh, to addressing that. What we find is that the reality does not fit into these boxes that get created. I mean obviously it is a sort of um, conceptualization but the reality sort of moves across different boxes and attempt to address them needs to we having is something which is more bottom up and painful way approach to actually analyzing the situation and attempting to respond. Um, we find situations where quasi legal is more helpful than legal but then once having reached a quasi legal status in the cities people do want legal status. So there it is a the whole informality is a continuum of statuses. And it's where I think we need to understand and intervene and it doesn't help us to start with boxes and then attempt to answer the questions in the boxes. And that's the story that I do want to bring to through case studies on related to employment sector. Let's see how time goes and I've been told 45 minutes, yeah. yeah. Uh, housing, transport, citizenship issues. Uh, we have a huge amount of research done at the Center for Urban Equity in India in SEPT University uh, and housing as well. Uh, transport, how do we deal with this informal transport which we call paratransit that exists and how do you sort of improve the conditions in that and citizenship is also so, uh, sort of there is no black and white in citizenship yes or no in urban areas it is a continuum of citizenship or it is a incremental citizenship that is achieved by the new migrants and I am going to present these cases and sort of um, what I am saying today is also a loud thinking from my side because we in our own teaching program we are grappling with this reality of capturing it and then responding to it. Recently, the Reserve Bank of India chairman, Governor Raghuram Rajan said very recently because he was responding to the way the private sector works in India and he said that to the corporate India that stop jugad short, shortcuts or okay, quick fixing plan for a long haul. Um, in, and what he is referring to is the process of um, 
quick money making by an attempt focusing on quick money making by the private sector. And he says India needs a much larger and longer term haul of looking at how economic growth is going to happen. Uh, it's just sound of a warning to the private sector. Uh, in, in the housing areas, there has been lot of lot written on the urban informality as informality is a p paradigm of development, quiet encroachment of the ordinary, state of deregulation, ambiguity and exception, occupancy, urbanism and so on. We find uh, informality on account of state failure because for many people in India, they haven't experienced the welfare state. What they have experienced is sometimes a hostile state, uh, a predative state uh, in certain contexts. Uh, in certain contexts, the state is weak. It is unable to intervene and do uh, intervene for welfare or protect the weak, in, even if it aspires to. Uh, the state is also flexible. The rules can be violated. There are rules that are contradicting each other. It's left to the interpretation of the state to implement one or the other legislation. And I'm not going to discuss there more, but uh, in, in the symposium on street vendors, I, we, we have studied the different legislation that impacts street vending in Indian context. And I'm going to discuss that at that point in time. Uh, so because of this sort of, so there's a different uh, takes on why informality exists. Either it's an over-regulatory framework because that's what legalistic keep us saying that if you remove the regulations that informal illegality will go and informality will go. Uh, or informality is, it's the political economy of wealth generation that leads to the kind of informal arrangements that are there. So there are various different takes on it uh, in the informal uh, system. What is Yeah, this is what I've said that informality in Indian context, and I'm only speaking about urban, this rural sector is entirely informal, so I'm not going to go there. It's, it's in the urban context that I, I, I'll focus my discussion. Mm, about two thirds of urban employment in India, as per the National Sample Survey employment statistics, are informal. Uh, but in the higher high growth states such as Gujarat, where I come from, where, from the, where the Prime Minister Modi comes from, has about four fifths of employment as informal. So economic growth, yeah. So it, economic growth uh, in many of the states in India is pushed through the informal, the employment, and, and this is in. Um, uh, I'm talking about the employment. So in, in spite of economic growth, the employment is more informal in many states. Uh, with very low wages, very almost no social protection existing. Uh, housing, of course, all of us know is very largely informal. Two thirds of housing is informal in violation of some or the other legislation that exists, either town planning legislation or building codes or, or even land <coughs> regulations that are there, multi plethora of them are there. Transport is also very largely, and we are just discovering in a big way, informal. Uh, public transport to best is around 25% on an average across all the cities. Larger cities have more public transport. Smaller cities have more walking and cycling and other non-motorized infrastructure, uh, motorized facilities. They are all the informal sector. There is something which we call paratransit, or there's a fancy word used which is called intermediate public transport. It's operated by private trans private operators. Um, auto rickshaws, three wheelers with all kinds of combinations, cycle rickshaws fitted now with sometimes batteries and so on. So there's a whole range of this uh, transport vehicles which are there. Uh, public transport is also, part of it is outsourced and pri privatized and run by unregulated transport operators. Uh, which is sometimes hazardous and we had this, a very serious case of a woman getting raped in one of the buses in 2012 December in Delhi, the national capital because the whole entire, some of this transport being unregulated uh, outside the control and uh, monitoring of the uh, public sector or the local government. And citizenship is also um, 
in a way, it's incremental. It's initially when people come and how they uh, uh, claim their citizenship over a period of time. So it's also, so they, th and this all get linked with each other. India is currently at low level of urbanization. So we are expecting these processes to continue for quite some time. Officially, it is 33%, but a World Bank document puts it at 52%. So you see there also there are estimates which are varying uh, by 20 percentage points. So what to call urban, what not to call urban is also under dispute. This is out of our work that we have done. Uh, we just looked at the way the employment sector is organized. This is natural sample survey data. And uh, there is the way the em employment statistics are uh, classified is, is its primary, secondary, and tertiary sector employment. And if we cross tab that with quality of employment, that is self-employed, regular employed, and casual labor. Regular employed is more formal, tending towards more formalization, but not necessarily fully formal. Uh, Self-employed is working out of home, etc. And casual labor is daily wage labor. And we have what we see in the secondary sector, that's the manufacturing sector. What we see is a change is uh, both in 2004 and 2005 and 2004, 5 and 2009, 10. It's a period of high growth in the Indian economy. And we see that uh, in the secondary sector for male, 31% worked out of home as self-employed. That's work, the manufacturing is outsourced to home-based work. And for women, it's, it was 61% uh, uh, in 2004, five, and continues to remain high 56% and 27% for men. So what you see is a tremendous amount of outsourcing piece rate work. So if, I don't know whether the new slogan of Make in India is going to expand this sector or it's going to expand more regular employment, it needs to be seen. We see for last 10 years, serious outsourcing of uh, work. We find for women, 27% uh, of the women workers in urban India work out of home. So that's quite a large number, uh, proportion of workers working out of home. And 66% of women working in the manufacturing sector work out of home. So there's lots of products that are manufactured in the homes, in the slums, in Indian context. Um, there is a book by Kalpana Sharma on rediscovering Dharavi, if anybody has read that. Um, almost everything, Everything that you buy in Mumbai is manufactured in slums, Dharavi, which is the largest slum of Asia, mm, including uh, IV fluid bottles, sutures for medical purpose, all kinds of sweets that you might eat in the Mumbai sweet shops, Karachi Halwa, for example. Of course, leather goods and other things do also get manufactured in the same slum. Um, so there, there, this is what has happened in, and it's not a re last 10 years, of course, it has increased, but uh, in Mumbai, it has been existing for 25, 30 years of outsourcing uh, manufacturing. The last leg is outsourced out into the households. Um, and it cuts across both, I think. Uh, it cuts across all the consumer goods, soaps, shampoos, etc., and even some of the edible goods. Anybody who knows India and it likes to eat the Indian junk food called <laughs> Pani Puri. The Puri is manufactured in slums. And so I tell my students that be careful when you eat these things. But I think our bacteria, stomach bacteria is used to this sort of a food. But there is a lot of vibrancy and, in, and outsourcing. And so the cost of manufacturing then gets passed on to the household. So the electricity, procurement of raw materials, etc., gets uh, outsourced. The working conditions are fairly hazardous uh, because here, they, this is in Ahmedabad where these are garment workers. There was a Vigo project we did some time back uh, and they, it's very small housing. housing. Housing is also informal. The quality of housing is also poor. It leaks water. Uh, it gets flooded in monsoon. Children are playing, 
work and, and spaces are small. So it's very difficult to carry out such activities, but nonetheless, there is no option. A, a lot of new, a lot of branded products get manufactured this way. Uh, especially garmenting industry, a uh, lot of textiles in Surat are also manufactured in the handloom, in the household sector. Uh, uh, export oriented uh, garments are also manufactured this way. I think st it's also across, I think, all of Southeast Asia too, that sort of a situation. Uh, this is incense stick makers, and this is really, really extremely hazardous working conditions. This is working in the house. Uh, these are all sort of chemicals which are ex em emit fuels, f uh, f fumes. So when you go and come back, you get this atmosphere itself covers you with the smell. So once we went to the site and came back to the office, people said, have you put some incense or a perfume on the body? It was nothing. We just visited and came back. Really hazardous. It might, uh, and children also help in the household work. So this is one. Um, so leading to what we say is <coughs> basically it's passing on the cost to the informal sector. This is structuralism. and way of looking at it is energy, rent of the house, unpaid labor of the family, pollution, costs, uh, that social costs of production are passed on to the family. Uh, there is a lot of underpayment through peace rate. And if a house, household is living in a far, far off area, and if there is a millman who is going to serve the household or give the work to the household lady, then the wages are further less. There is no way these workers have any position to bargain the peace rates that they get in the market. There is no social security because so to get a social security, you need to be registered as a worker. And uh, some of them don't get, because they're part-time doing household work and part-time working. So they are <coughs> their recognition as a worker is still under dispute. Uh, there is no mechanism to be registering as a worker because social security um, we don't have, we've just begun with unique identity card to f everybody gets a number and a card. But for that you need to have a residence which is legal residence and for informal ha households living in informal settlement, settlements many of them don't tend to have a legal address and they may be removed any time or displaced or evicted out and then their uh, so address goes and they are moving on to next address and so on. So it's difficult to find an address and then get registered as a worker. Of course, there isn't any mechanism to register them because the local governments should be doing. Local governments are just not able to collect the filth from the cities. They are not in a position to latch on to social, uh, onto the welfare agenda as yet. Uh, so housing is very, uh, um, and, and so they work in a situation where housing is a major sort of a problem uh, and bottleneck. So what do we do now? Housing security is the starting point for uh, formalizing the informal in the city. That itself, as my next few slides are going to show, is a very, very complex phenomena. Is unique identity card, uh, identity that is being now given to everybody an answer because there have been also counter arguments to unique ID uh, being given to individuals in India. It was started about five years back. And there is a big debate. I think some of the scholars from US universities also wrote to an open letter to the prime minister because when you have this unique ID card, which is, um, it becomes a good surveillance mechanism as well. And you have state prying in the private realm. So uh, people want unique ID card because the, that's what our experience is because it's very, very useful to prove your residency in the city and uh, get an identity to, as a citizen or resident of that city. Uh, but at the same time, it's also, it can be used for surveillance and we don't really have an answer whether this or that is useful, but people do. I'm, um, I was a member of the rehabilitation committee uh, for Sabarmati Riverfront Development. There's a Riverfront Development project that was taken up in Ahmedabad. Um, rehabilitation happened in 2011 and 12. And that's the time when these cards were being offered and people were very proud to display that because they thought that this is giving them an sort of a foothold in the city to say they are residents of the city to access housing. 
So there are two, it's, the arguments are on both sides, and we need to wait and see how it unfolds over time. Some of us are a bit scared because, well, in, in the smart city business as well as here, I think I would prefer not to use a credit card and use cash uh, because then my, my movements are traced and where what I've spent and the state will pry into it. And I, I feel very wary of using it. So lots, there are both sides of an argument to have an ID card now. Uh, well, India is a country which has absolutely no social security mechanism today, except the formerly employed workers. And even among the formerly employed workers, a large segment do not have social security. So to reach the social security to the informal workers is a big challenge. Uh, in 2008, we did in, in, in the pass a legislation called uh, Social Security, National Social Security Act 2008, which is mandatory to be implemented across the country. Mm, but no government, state government or local government has found mechanism of implementing it. So it's just a legislation to be implemented, but the state itself has sort of violated this legislation because it's not found mechanisms to imp implement this legislation as yet. Uh, the coverage in that legislation is very, very minimal. Uh, it's pension for the old age, uh, maternity benefits and insurance, uh, accident insurance and very low rates, but not yet been fully implemented as we see is, do some of the research in this area. The second, a um, lot of this informality is tied to the way housing gets uh, delivered. In our studies in the Indian various cities in India, we find different ways of uh, housing that gets um, provided. One is squatting on the public lands. People just come and squat on the open lands. Uh, the lands. Uh, Public land is not one unique category. It has different types of public lands. There are local government lands which have a different status um, with regards to if it has to be formalized. There are state government lands. There are different central government organizations whose lands get squatted upon. Uh, the most prominent of the lands that get squatted upon is the railways land. So if you go to Indian India and travel in Indian railways, you would see lots of um, squatters on both sides of the railway track. And Bombay in particular, in Mumbai in particular, if you go, if you, when as a child we travel from Mumbai, Ahmedabad to Mumbai, it's about uh, 400 kilometers by train. And the smell that wakes you up in the morning, you know Mumbai has arrived. So uh, the public lands are the largest toilets uh, public toilets in Indian context. So you, and that situation doesn't seem to have not changed for, for many, many years. And you see, as you say in favelas, you also see here ground plus one, ground plus two structures along, all along, along which have incrementally expanded to include uh, ex uh, additional population. Uh, there are also squatting on forest reserve lands. And in some of the ecologically fragile areas, there is fair amount of encroachment on the forest lands. Uh, there is a research that we are undertaking now in a city called Gohati in the Northeast India, which is the entrance to the Northeast India. Northeast India is ecologically fragile and ethnic conflict uh, oriented region. And there, there's lots of Gohati is the largest city in that region. And um, there is fair amount of forest land encroachment as well as natural wetlands encroachment. That's, that's the only way housing is being provided in the city. Uh, so each one of them have a different status. For example, reserve forest lands, there can never be a uh, tenure regularization on those lands. Railways will never give lands for housing purposes because they may need it for their own expansion of the railway network. There are encroachment of defense lands. Defense ministry are never going to give away these lands for formalizing. Uh, local government may 
formalize the tenure. So, if we had an answer to formalizing the tenure as a way out of informal housing, uh, <coughs> local governments may give this land, but our research in Ahmedabad shows that they do not, <coughs> because land is used as a financial resource for uh, getting more money to put in infrastructure. So, tendency is not to formalize the give tenure to the dwellers of informal settlements. Uh, so, there is a big question on then whose land, who is going to give this land <coughs> for informal housing or formalizing the housing. Uh, the other way is squatting on lands granted for social purposes. <coughs> that are, there are religious lands which get grant from the government and then they resell. <coughs> so, there are land grants done for social sector, social purposes, education, hospitals, religious trusts. If they face shortage of money, they tend to informally sell it off to slum dwellers. If we want to formalize them, we have no way to do anything about it and the quality of life continues to deteriorate <coughs> eventually. Industrial housing was provided in some parts in 1950s, 1960s. That has also now got squatted upon. And if industries have closed down, then there is no owner of the land, there is nobody who has taken the land and it continues to deteriorate. The most largely prevalent way of informal housing <coughs> provision is commercial subdivision on the peripheral areas of the city, where that is where I think over regulations have actually done this, because there are multiple regulations which are to be um, uh, cleared before this land can be formally accepted and get a formal titling. Uh, but every the builders, private builders, land owners, agriculturalists, so nobody wants to go through the formal co process, because there is a cost to formalizing. And, and so, it is better not to and nobody cares, because finally, uh, evictions on from this, because these are private lands. So, government has no uh, jurisdiction over doing anything with those lands. And that is to the extent 60 to 70 percent of the informal housing is on such kind of lands, which are private lands informally squatted upon, because the private landowners have given away these lands for subdivisions and commercial exploitation. If they were to go through a formal process, in many cases there is no land master plan as you know, uh, land uh, finally the city's development happens through master plan because it is a statutory uh, policy, a uh, statutory document and it is a statutory requirement to have land use for each of the parcel of land within a city. And these developments are outside the master plan boundary. And so, by the time the new master plan is done, the development has already incurred. And, and so, how, what do we do about it, uh, if we have to implement the master plan? And so, master plan changes to accommodate the existing realities, rather than master plan guiding the development. So, master plan is a post facto intervention, rather than an uh, earlier intervention or planning intervention in, in many of the cases. There are, there is one particular land legislation that was introduced in India in 1976 and now repealed, which was called Urban Land Sealing and Regulation Act. India went through this phase of what we is in inverted comma socialist phase of land management and government in 1976 brought an Urban Land Sealing Act, which said that there is a ceiling on individual holding, holding of land in the cities uh, and it depended on the size of the city. Uh, the ceiling was determined. So, for large cities, the land one could hold on to was vacant land one could hold on to was small, and for small cities, it was large. But that has been repealed. So, as soon as the lands were to be as were earmarked for uh, <coughs> uh, as in surplus and to be acquired for government for social housing, the private owners just informally sold it off to land developers, and there is massive, I think, entire about 50, 60 square kilometer of area in um, east of Ahmedabad is entirely urban land sealing act being sold off this way. And 
now the l law has been repealed but there is no counter legislative mechanisms to legalize them and so they are all lying in limbo uh, and one doesn't know how do we legalize this sort of developments that we have. In many places whenever there is a public housing there is an informal illegal developments that accompany it and after a while so there are it's so it's if we one talks about informal housing there isn't one way and so there is obviously no one answer to how this has to be addressed uh, but nonetheless something that is common uh, across is most of them do tend to have poor infrastructure poor living conditions uh, very high densities extremely high densities of living though it's um, not high rise high density it is low rise high density <coughs> developments where public spaces are very limited there are no places for children to play uh, very difficult often to lay in infrastructure water sanitation infrastructure uh, if they have to be laid then there is a th there would be and it would entail a lot of displacements that would occur and some people are going to lose out in the game of formalizing uh, so this is the condition and then and, and hence the answer to this is also not very easy. Uh, answer to this in urban policy or housing policy has been to redevelop those sites into high rise buildings through use of land management tools, especially TDR transfer of development rights that has been used quite, quite a lot in US context in, in uh, inner city revitalization projects. And, uh, in the multi-story living conditions, uh, some of these people, it's not easy, they don't find it easy to get uh, adjusted into this. Uh, <coughs> and so one half, you have limits in improving, improving the informal sector. If you move towards improving the informal and formalizing the housing through various, I mean, we have made multiple attempts in housing policy to formalize this. The last one being a slum redevelopment scheme that is redeveloping the site into multi-story buildings, giving higher floor space index. I hope you know what is floor space, FSI, FAR, whatever it is. So, <coughs> giving higher FSI. Uh, the problem is that the first problem that is encountered in, in this formalizing is what the definition of a household itself. What is a household? Because these are a lot of them live in joint families. And so when new housing units have to be given, then who, which unit of the housing, the, the joint family gets the housing? Would the parent, fa because, and these are also uh, patriarchal families, so it's the male member, adult, eldest male member in the family, that's the father or the eldest son of the family, or if there are two or three sons, who gets it? And there are lots of conflicts that ensue you on account of deciding this. Uh, we have come across cases in the rehabilitation process of dealing with this reality. Uh, the new housing that is given is very, very small, uh, 225 square feet, that's 22.5 square meter of housing. Uh, uh, and so it's really very small, it's just two rooms, um, two rooms and toilet attached. And joint families can't, multiple units can't live in this housing. There is no way they can informally expand because or the informal housing has an advantage of incrementally improving as per your family's requirements and that doesn't happen here. And, and so it's not really working very well. Uh, some of them do. If you're, f if you're going to be evicted out and there's no option, then people accept that. If not, otherwise, uh, this is not a preferred sort of a housing. So now we are stuck in, in our housing solution. Uh, it is something of to the extent of 18.8 .8 million housing shortage in the country in urban India. And this <coughs> the, there's a big housing question which is remain unanswered. Uh, we're watching what Brazil is doing and we're going to be going through a pain of this transition of in the housing sector. Uh, and so there are going to be lots of people going to be living in an informal status. status. I think this we know that legality does give an advantage to some extent. It does create uh, assets at the local level uh, for investment. It also leads to more efficient land uses. Uh, it does in sort of invite private sector investment, but it also leads to uh, and what we uh, find here is inequitable land use. There is 
when in formalization happens, it also leads to, with, if it is not bottom up driven, it does lead to uh, massive um, gentrification uh, in, in, in the process and marginalization of some people. Uh, what we have been arguing that it, in the shorter run, we need to move towards more uh, de facto uh, increase enhancing the perceived security of tenure. I think Jeffrey Payne has written quite a bit on, on this. When Hanandu Di Soto came to India and it was government of India was sort of mesmerized by the ideas that he had of giving property titles to the slum dwellers. And so at that time in um, 2013 or so, we uh, 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 unveiled a new housing program at the national level called Raji Vavas Yojana. And giving property titles was the base of uh, the entire program. Given the complexity of the land situation that I described earlier, um, it is not possible to give land titles. It requires a lot of, it's a very expensive way of going ahead. Unless new social housing with massive subsidies are, are sort of put in, which is at the, at the moment India doesn't have that much of money. What we argued for is that let's not go for the final solution, which is required in the long run, but in the short run, let's give shorter term tenure security to settlements where it is possible, which is give de facto so shelter secure land tenure system. As we move on, uh, we should be able to move from more intermediate tenure to long term tenure situation, legal tenure. And this is what our, some of our planning uh, for some of our research also tell us that when, yeah, when we start by uh, giving uh, short term tenure security, the aspirations of people move to long term. Uh, in the process of short term tenure security, household assets increase, incomes increase, women tend to participate more in the labor force than otherwise and it leads to improve in the reduction in poverty and increase in family assets and wealth. At, at that time they do want to shift to more legal housing and this is if there is a supply of low cost housing, it's possible to make the transition. We are unable to make a leapfrogging into formal system, but informal uh, giving de facto tenure and then moving on to legal tenure would be a way that works. Uh, well, I, since the time is limited, what is Informality, especially in the current context of climate change, uh, climate vulnerability, etc., we are finding it extremely difficult to negotiate uh, and find solutions to informal housing. Uh, we have this situation where uh, there is, because of this climate variability, either there is high temperature and there is uh, there is drought, and so parts of the um, year you don't have water supply. Uh, or reliable water supply or co quality water supply, monsoon the same settlement gets flooded. And so it's happening in dry, dry cities as well and it's obviously the some of the cities with high rainfall it's even worse. Uh, the go example of Gauhati, uh, and so what, uh, we <coughs> in the whole process of uh, yeah, I have shifted. Uh, Gauhati city, we would see, is is it's, it's a very ecologically fragile uh, city. It's between Brahmaputra on the north and there's a, uh, there's hills on the bottom, so there is no land for city expansion. The city is only a million city, so it's a very small city by Indian size, and uh, <coughs> and all the housing is for even middle class, and the ministers is on encroach lands, wetland lands, and the poor are now have been shifted to encroaching the hills. Uh, and, and they are reserve forests. What we see perpetually in the city is this sort of living condition because these areas get flooded. The land is not stable. So the water table rises, the land rises up in monsoon, and then it settles down. And so you can't have any housing other than this sort of a housing. This is also earthquake prone zone. So this type of housing is what is done uh, or else there is encroachment on the hills. These are all hills. There are a lot of landslides uh, that happens because of encroachment on the hills. And so monsoon is what, last week it was like this in the city. 
And this time it has been late monsoon, thanks to climate change variability that we experience. So this has now become a regular feature. And we wanted to hold a workshop in Guwahati. Now we have to postpone it to January because the city was in flood when we, we had planned our workshop. And this is a regular occurrence. And so you have the other side of informality, which leads to this sort of living condition. And here we do need to find ecological answers to ad addressing the city. Informal transport is the last point that I wanted to make. Uh, uh, public transport is, as I said, quarter, so 27 percent on the whole, but it's 44 percent in large cities, but the small towns, it's very, very little. There isn't much of public transport. And if it is there, say for example, Delhi, a lot of it is outsourced to private operators. Walking and cycling are 39 percent of the trip, something that you are trying to do here. We already have, but this is distress, no choice walking and cycling. This is not choice cycling or walking. And so if, if there is an increase in wealth in the family, they are going to transit to motorized vehicles. Because first generations does have an aspiration to move to motorized vehicles. Uh, informal transport that is auto rickshaws and all forms of auto rickshaws, shared auto rickshaws, individual auto rickshaws uh, do replace public transport. That's why it's called intermediate public transport, operated by unregulated private operators. Mm. <coughs> and largely, the new urban periphery is sort of uh, is served by this form of thing. In, in Indian context, the land developer development happens first and then the planning moves in and then the public sector, public transport moves in. It's just the reverse in China where actually it's planned, public transport goes and then people go and leave. We have a complete, the entire urbanization is driven through land interest and that's the reason the way the urban form takes and so the services come in the last. So even middle class colonies and housing suffer for lack of services for the first few years and the services co come in l later, the roads come in later and public transport is the last to come in any locality. Uh, and, and so there is a f either you, if you have money, you depend on your private motorized transport, two wheelers, that's why very, very popular Indian climate permits that or four wheeler as you move up the income ladder as a status symbol as well. Or else then you are dependent on paratransit and paratransit if not affordable then it's a shared paratransit. You have five, six, eight, ten people sort of packed into one of this. This, this is the form of transport. You can't see it well but what is happening in Gohati they've attempt to formalize and the, what they, these are called trackers. Uh, they are jeeps which can pack in eight to ten people and uh, there are numbers and routes put at the top. So there is some way of uh, giving them roots and formalizing the system. Uh, the women don't like to use, they, they are forced to use it, but they don't like because they're packed in with men sitting in, very close by and they face far, far um, l uh, quite a bit of harassment using this sort of a transport. Another new chain that is happening, this is Delhi, this is e-rickshaws, they're called electronic rickshaws. And there were earlier, cycle rickshaws which have been replaced by this and uh, central parts of Delhi has quite a lot of this now moving around. Uh, this e-rickshaws and cycle rickshaws give the last leg connectivity from the metro station to the uh, residential colony. So if done well and used well, there is a, this would be of great use of giving public transport connectivity into residential areas in Delhi it's been formalized because there are also some organizations which have uh, assisted and fought legal battles to get them legalized and accepted in the Delhi system. What we also lastly see is incremental citizenship. It gets tied up with the employment status and the housing status is that they tend to come into an informal settlement the first thing as an identity they get because Indian democracy at least assists people to get an election card. So they all become voters and it's a vote bank politics which assists the informal sector and the poor to find a foothold in the city. And 
once they get that, they ha there is that card with their photograph, uh, which, which asks for an address. Nobody goes and verifies the address, so that's fine. People do play with the system and get this, and gradually go get on to getting electricity connection. Using this two addresses, they get a bank. So a lot of people have now, under the new program, opened up bank accounts. Uh, driving license, nobody bothers to check which whether your address is there. So you can just subvert the system, find a way around, and get some address eventually. And then you get a ration card. We still hold on to it because there are some ration cards which which are for the below poverty line where you get an address and all the names of the family members are entered into it. And that's one of the most important legal document that any household offers, especially in the uh, 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 low income segments. Uh, middle classes are not very, and once the settlement is now the new system that's there because municipal corporation, municipal authorities are finding a stress financially and they Anyway, uh, the political pressure and the pol political process ensures that the water, water and sanitation are extended into the informal sector. So governments, local governments have begun to argue that why not then tax them for the services that are being given and extended. So now property tax is also being collected and then that's finally the thing when property tax bill is there, everybody holds on to the bill and that's sort of semi-legal status which will help them to legalize. So what do we do now? That's the big question uh, that we are grappling with. It, our understanding is that the informality does provide space for disempowered new migrants, etc., to get into the urban system and find a foothold. It provides them possibility of maneuvering themselves in the urban system and getting an incremental citizenship. But it also has a situation, uh, creates conflicts because of many of this informal settlements, because in, in places where uh, public services have not come in, you have large number of non-state actors present in the delivery of services. There are competition between non-state actors in provision of delivery of services leading to conflicts. There are lack of conflict. I think there is uh, emerging literature on violence and cities and sort of conflicts what in daily lives of people on account of lack of presence of state in the welfare si system. And we find, and there is an, a research that we are currently undertaking, which is funded by the IDRC under the Safe and Inclusive Cities program. And we find massive conflicts on the peri urban areas where state is absent in the welfare space. And uh, this is the conflict between the, co and it can lead to if homicides at some point in time. So it's, it's not a situation of conflict and violence that you see in Latin American context on account of drugs, gangs, and um, mafias. But this is another sort of conflict where what their water mafias, electricity mafias, which are providing services to, to the informal community. So this is a situation which is not sustainable in the long run. As I said, even the situation of informal housing in some of the ecological areas is also not sustainable. In the long run, we need to find. So how, how do we formalize if we want to formalize is the big question. And the answer would be probably in its implementation than academic discourse, because we need to see how actually we are going to put it into practice. What helps sometimes is at least spaces for the poor have been found because of the Indian democratic electoral political system. Uh, mobilization and building the, the cities from the bottom probably is an answer, but nobody is listening to us at the moment because we are busy with the smart city paradigm and there isn't any reflection of this reality into the smart city uh, debate discourse, if, if at all there is any. Thank you. Uh, this was uh, uh, an incredible presentation, um, uh, both impressive in, in terms of the range of uh, problems that you presented and their interconnection, and of course very depressing as well, uh, because the, there are no easy solutions at all. Uh, and, and so th this was really very difficult, Tritib, 
<laughs> to give me <laughs> this task. Uh, but um, so I'm going to uh, uh, make two, two comments. And uh, the first one, uh, uh, first of all, I have to say that I really don't know the India, uh, uh, the context in India well to be able to give you some specific idea. So I'm, I'm going to limit myself to com uh, two comments. One of them is very general, and the other one is more specific but very speculative. OK, so the general one. Uh, and here I, uh, I, I have to draw on the only historical experience I, I kind of know, and that is what happened in the US uh, towards the turn of the century. Uh, when uh, we had this tremendous uh, set of popular movements, which are known as the progressive era. Uh, and uh, y you probably know something about this, but there were movements uh, to, to try to uh, deal uh, with all of the sanitary problems that uh, the large cities faced. And so uh, groups of people, and some of them were engineers, but many uh, uh, people who basically uh, were very interested in, in, in the fate of their particular cities came together. Uh, there were housing <coughs> reform movements that basically led to the development of city planning as a profession, but also uh, the development of social work as a profession. And so in a real sense, these movements led to the formalization uh, of many of our institutions, uh, good government movements that led to you know, the uh, comprehensive budgets and things like that. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, they were popular movements. Uh, and they were, uh, they were not nonprofits, <laughs> actually. Uh, they, they were uh, uh, groups that got together in, uh, in social clubs, in a sense, uh, that really felt something about the city. And these were notable people with a lot of money in, in some cases some of them professionals, and all kinds of people. And in a real sense, it seems to me that you need something like that, that uh, you know, the move towards uh, the nonprofit sector, in one sense, has, uh, has eroded any kind of tradition we may still have had uh, in that area. A and I think that it's still the kind of movement that uh, may be viable in some of the large cities. Because the fact is that we do relate to the, the fortunes and the fates of our cities, right? We, even if, we're comp you know, if we are so wealthy, uh, nevertheless, we cannot escape uh, some of the context of cities. And so th there is an inherent interest, I think, on the part of everyone uh, to try to make an urban environment better. Uh, and, and there may be something to learn about that. I mean, uh, I grew up in New York City, and there are still remnants of some of those movements. The Regional Plan Association has been tremendously influential for a very long time in New York City. The Municipal Art Society, which has this uh, very interesting and kind of art, uh, 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 artistic type of a name, but nevertheless, it was really influential in getting uh, a lot of uh, uh, the, the city leaders involved in reforms and things like that. And, and there may be a place for something like that uh, in large cities in, in India. Uh, and um, it, it's, a, it's a really wonderful movement. And it makes you think that, in a real sense, we need something like that as well. It's not only India or, uh, or other places that are, are still somewhat developing, but it's the fact that uh, those were the places where all kinds of things were invented. And it seems to me that that's been a whole century ago. And we, we also require new institutions as well. And, and there, there may be uh, opportunities to do something like that again. And, and we don't really have them. I mean, wh what is it? We have chambers of commerce, but they're so focused on their own interests. And so, and, and so it seems to me that that, that may be something to think about. Um, 
Oh, and, and the other, this is completely uh, crazy, but uh, <laughs> uh, I've been thinking about 3D manufacturing. And I don't know whether you've seen it, but it seems that the Chinese have now uh, uh, figured out, th there's a group in China that has figured out how to do at least two-story buildings with 3D manufacturing. My idea is that we should be able to develop four or five story buildings through 3D manufacturing, which I think I if you were able to control the, uh, the uh, manufacturing process could really bring down the costs of housing. And, uh, and it could also, if you, if you can get that kind of medium sized density, it, you would reduce the need for land for one. And uh, uh, I think somebody should try it. <laughs> and SEPT, I, I think, would, would be a good place to try to uh, figure something like this out. But of course, you also have the problem of infrastructure. And uh, I, I think you could actually do the same thing with water and uh, sewage infrastructure. Why not apply 3D manufacturing to this and reduce the cost so that when you do what we call here in the U.S. a kind of subdivision, uh, uh, new development, that you could do very cheap infrastructure, kind of a package type of infrastructure, and, and uh, moderate uh, uh, density type of housing. A and that may, may provide at least uh, uh, some part of the solution. But you explained so many problems that uh, I, I think it would take us a whole year <laughs> to really discuss them in full and figure out uh, some ideas that might be useful to you. Well, I hope this helps. And at this point, we might as well open it to anybody else who has ideas or comments. Yes, um, you were talking about providing um, ID cards to citizens of India, and I was just wondering, um, has the government thought of any ideas of how to deal with like migrant populations from Bangladesh and that process? Uh, that's be, uh, largely a question in the northeastern states in India. Uh, just today I was reading news uh, that the uh, government of India has decided to give them identity to the migrants who have come up to 2014. And the news items say that this is going to harm the interest of BJP, that's Bharatiya Janta Party. Those who know Indian politics, it's a right wing economically and politically and socially right wing political party. Uh, who is holding power in India. And uh, they, a uh, year and a half back, not here, two years, uh, two years back, nearly before the 2014 May election, the current prime minister went to Northeast and promised the Northeast states that they will stop the illegal migration of Bangladeshis into India. And now they have actually, because you can't just identify who is a Bangladeshi versus who is not a Bangladeshi. Because there are also local Assamese Muslims, there are Muslims who have come from West Bengal. Those who know India, India has some multiple languages and each state has its own language and culture, etc. So uh, the Bang Bangladesh was formal East and West Bang Bang Bengal uh, divided. And Bangladesh uh, has largely concentration of Muslim uh, Bengalis, though there are also Hindu Bengalis living, but largely that it was fully a part of Pakistan and now it's separated out. So there is a big political issue because in 1971, Bangladesh became a country and there was a lot of refugee infusion into India. Many of them stayed back uh, in, in Assam, West Bengal. Uh, some of them came to other states in India, but subsequently because um, state of Assam has a lot of forest lands and there have been continuous migration from Bangladesh into this forest areas and Bang there have been occupancy of forest lands in that part uh, leading to co ethnic conflict because um, about five years back there was a ma massive ethnic co conflict between one of the tribes of Assam called Bodos and the Bangladeshi Muslim. It was really very violent. 
uh, it was at the center was the land issue. So now the government is saying they're going to offer formal residency to this population. So we don't know. So that's a very, very uh, extremely sensitive issue in Northeast India. But that's been there. For them to get an identity card is a Muslim, it's a problem. Even Bengali Muslims sometimes get identified as Bangladeshis. And there are communal conflicts in Ahmedabad city on this issue. So that's a very sensitive issue. There's the, the necessity of the formalizing of structures, especially from the state, uh, the government perspective. But then you also kind of tongue in cheek or joke about your, your own suspicion of the government, right? And so if you have a desire to formalize more of these structures in the state is necessary for regulation, empowering citizens, those sorts of things. Um, how do you reconcile the perspective that? There, yeah, there's a larger debate on deepening democracy in India and whether there is just an electoral de democracy adequate enough to define India as a democracy. And do citizens have the rights or not? And it's the citizens' rights versus the state. And state, I think, everywhere now is uh, more security freak, and there's a lot of surveillance of its own citizens. I mean, US is a good example of how it has gone about. And India is following with all this partnership with US the same way. So, that and, and, and Indian state has not been able to control a lot of this infiltration, etc. So there is this issue on security. So there is also that fear that uh, is there now. That's why it's a dilemma. We don't have the answer as yet. So that's why it's a tongue in cheek in both sense. Um, it is indeed too that if I use a credit card here, Indian income tax is going to ask me who funded your travel to US. I don't want to answer that every year to the Indian Income Tax Department. So I prefer not to be sort of using a credit card here to get track of my travel. Of course, I can be tracked since I've gone through immigration, but income tax is the most feared of the government organizations <laughs> everywhere. And so, <laughs> so there is both sides and, huh? <laughs> everywhere, I think that's. So well, we d sorry, uh, we don't really have an answer. But the d sometimes the it depends. I mean, if uh, if you are a new migrant, you might like this identity because that's the first entry into it being accepted as a citizen or resident of that city. But uh, sometimes you don't. So it, it's it's everything is fluid. Sometimes in certain contexts you want it, in certain contexts you don't want it, and there isn't any answer to it. I was thinking that, you know, in this case, there's a huge trust deficit that we have with the government. Even yes. with the urban middle class, there's a huge trust deficit with local government. And my question would be, why not informality? Because the government, government or state actors seem to harass citizens and, you know, talk about the marginalized, the migrants, that is this levels of harassment at different levels, right? There is harassment. The processes are still very bureaucratic. Um, there are no results, as you clearly pointed out. There is a lot of deterioration that we have seen over the years. So this kind of trust deficit and, you know, it, it kind of begs the question then, does formalization really help or does it really end up hurting you know, certain segments of the, you know, population. And, and especially in an urban context, I can, you know, just by sheer experience, I, I know, you know, it does more to harm than to help some of these. Well, uh, yeah, that's the legal, very much a legalist argument. And uh, it's easy to convince everybody that uh, given severe trust deficit, uh, with the government, not just local government, for all levels of government. And so nobody wants to sort of engage with any politician or anybody today in Indian context. So it just speak of volumes about the quality of democracy that we have. And the answer doesn't lie in continuing this, but I think we need to change through social movements, as you had said, uh, character of Indian state. 
I don't find any other answer to it. Because if we have to move ahead, we have to challenge the character of Indian state. And as this term that it, uh, sort of uh, came up in the Latin American context of five second democracy is also true in Indian context. So people need to claim the state back and ask the state to be more welfare state than what it is becoming what you're describing as a predatory state. So you don't want to get any government official, either the police or the local bureaucracy or the income tax person or anybody knocking on your door, you don't want them coming. I, I we purchased a new house and we're not inviting any friends home because we don't want any IT fellow or anybody to come in the house because you don't know the outcome of what will happen. So there is a very serious breakdown of trust with this local state. What is keeping India in balance is all the local level organization, social organization, caste networks, this, that, and the other. That is keeping society in the balance, but it can also anytime turn over into a conflictuous situation of uh, Assamese versus Bengali, uh, Bangladeshi Muslims. And in Gujarat, we had big agitation uh, and violence that ensued from it when middle caste Patels versus non Patels, and it's still a sort of a volcanic situation now. So, we have this fragmentation. I, India is also a country which is unique in the world with a lot of social fragmentation on religion, caste, and uh, regional identities. So, anytime you completely informalize and allow this uh, dynamics to play out, you would have dominance of some of this forces taking over the decision making. And it is seeing, you can see cities f f completely segmented on religious lines. So you have a Hindu Ahmedabad and the Muslim Ahmedabad and a border between the two. Uh, and it's, in fact, in recently, just last week, uh, in one of our case study city where Muslims have been rehabilitated on a site, the lady who, there's one lady who had some theft in the house. She went to the police station to report uh, and she gave her address as Pakistan, Watwa Ahmedabad. So everybody is wondering why this Pakistan, but because it's a Muslim majority area, the local usage of the term is Pakistan. And so you also informality leads to this conflicts and divisions in the society. I, that's why we actually don't have an answer, but we are struggling with that if can we intervene in city development processes in a way that is fair distribution of local resources through local area plans, participatory mechanisms, which are, as you illustrated uh, very well in US, that was possible. We are <coughs> finding whether that's going to help us. Are we able to do that? Because we still conservative traditional society and we have not even modernized in science, modernization not in any other sense, but scientifically thinking, rationally thinking society. So all community and communal organizations tend to then become communal, leading to conflicts. Uh, it reminds me that what uh, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith was the ambassador under the Kennedy administration. He described India as a functioning anarchy <laughs> at that time. So it looks like it, the picture has been changed, but it's still sort of a it is Yeah, but uh, the anarchy is expanding and deepening anarchy, so. Uh, but the other, the other point I want to make, uh, uh, Professor Blanco's point, uh, going back to the US, reform movement of the progressive era at the turn of the last century. Um, I thought in India, there is, the civil society is also kind of becoming stronger and more active. I mean, there are examples like Sewa, which has been, it's actually another one, basically, right? Uh, which was a sort of a society for uh, women, uh, a working women association, or something like that. Um, there was some group who were uh, looking for the um, the rights of the homeless. In fact, they're talking about even the constitutional amendment saying that the housing is a basic right. So if you squat on the public land, you cannot be removed because in the state cannot provide housing. This person finds housing. Um, but if you address that, I mean, is, isn't there some uh, um, movement, development, civil society among the educated middle class? Also, the Ahmadmi and the, yeah. uh, uh, the 
and also the kind of the whistleblowing and the, the corruption and so all that is going on. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, sort of new situations also emerging. I mean, that's the hope that we have uh, this Aam Admi Party completely sweeping Delhi elections uh, was asking for a change and any new person comes in and puts a political party and shows some promise uh, does attract people's confidence because of I mean everything is broken the trust with all the political parties and the state so anybody new comes in and does get this sort of a, so that those sort of move, uh, movements are much more powerful than the civil society organizations that have come up externally funded because with this administration they have lost out and this administration is not listening to the civil society organizations funded through external funding but if there are indigenous grassroots mobilization then the government is obviously afraid of them because their whole electoral political balance get uh, sort of toppled out so there are um, Organizations of scheduled caste or Dalit movements, they have become, they are strong in the country. They are not finding as much representation in the media, but they do exist and they are influencing or influential. You have backward caste organizations. So there are a lot of new political mobilizations that can be seen in the, in the country uh, that we see. But in terms of delivery of services, we still do not find uh, that translating into improved delivery of services at the moment though at some level transparency because of whistleblowing uh, Facebook and other social media that is there but it is not yet improving the local state and its service delivery so we still have to wait for that to get translated into it. Thank you.